Yeah, sure. So um, good morning, aloha, everybody. Uh, greetings from, from us in, in Hawaii. Um, and um, we are today from this uh, middle of the Pacific Ocean Island in Hawaii Island. So I want to send aloha. And also just to start with the aloha, as I say here, um, also very, I think, appropriate for this session. We, As we learned over the last few years, we've been living here. We many of us have a sense of aloha as as meaning love and care and, and a kind of a, a typical greeting, but another very important and I think special meaning that applies to the session is aloha is also if you break down the word is um, alo which is the forward facing of the face and ha which is breath, and so aloha also means the 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 forward facing breath that we encounter all life and we encounter life on a day to day level. And it's also uh, the, the greeting that many around Polynesia have of the sharing of the breath with uh, as a very intimate form of, of greeting. So you might have seen the the, the honey and, and they have that in, in New Zealand too, where you share breath by touching the nose. And it's also a very beautiful greeting um, and a reminder of our connection to all that breathes. I know that that is alive and is breathing. We share the breath with that. So just wanted to share that breath with you all uh, this morning. Um, so I'm Udi Mandel. I'm one of the, the co-founders of the uh, Enliven Cooperative that we're going to talk about, um, but also of one of the partner and uh, hosting places of the of this conference, which is the, the Ecoversities Alliance. So um the cooperative, as we're going to share a little bit, was in a way birthed through uh, multiple friends within uh, the alliance. Um, and just as a oh, shall I share the photo of where we are, and then pass to Rosemary? Um, I'm going to just answer Kelly. Um, and unfortunately, two of our co friends hosts for this session um, couldn't make it today for multiple life related reasons, but maybe Gerardo might be able to drop in to, um, in a few minutes. But just to say, uh, this is where we are here. Yeah. Oops, can I, just one sec. Just a... So we are um, in this place here and this picture, which is just uh, outside where we are, um, was for a bioregioning conversations meeting where we had to put two chairs to give the sense of that we're in conversation from our bioregion. But I wanted to share this picture too, not only because it's where we are, but also uh, in terms of the interbeing place issue that we talk about. In between the chairs, uh, another being turned up. You can just see in the background there, which is a, a, a big green turtle climbing on the rock that I, I did not see when I was taking the picture, until, but then it kind of turned up there. So this sense of the multiple beings that we are participating in, um, I wanted to bring them into the space too. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Aloha. Um, I'm Kelly Timmy, still waking up. So excuse me if I'm a little, um, not quite as centered as Udi. Um, I, um, I'm also a co-founder of the Enlivened Cooperative, um, and as you mentioned, we're here on Hawaii Island on Hilo East Side, where where it's the rainforest side of the island. Um, and yeah, I'm going to pass it on to Rosemary because I'll say a little a little bit more about the Enliven Cooperative in a few minutes. Hi, so greeting from Flagstaff, Arizona, and maybe we could actually click to that slide. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to. <laughs> So my name is Rosemary and um, I've lived in this region for 25 years. This is our beautiful sacred mountain, the San Francisco Peaks. Um, so I live in the ancestral lands of the Diné and the Hopi and 11 other indigenous um, sovereign tribes that call this place home. I've lived here, the whole time I've lived here, I've connected in some way to education and growing food, um, raising two wonderful daughters and um, doing my best to uh, be an educator at Northern Arizona University where I um, try to create spaces in my classroom for healing and for some levels of transformation to the degree that it's possible 
um, also with the School of Earth and Sustainability. So it's so wonderful to be here. It's an honor to be here also with Udi and Kelly and if Gerardo drops in, we did make some slight modifications to our offering today. Um, so I will be sharing a couple of projects that are not directly in live and learning sponsored, but tie very deeply into the themes of um, the work that we're all doing together. Welcome. Um, so actually, I don't know if, okay, there. So, um, I um we're, we're working with Udi and others. Um, we work to co-found the Ecoversities Alliance, um, and through that, about three years ago, we decided to create our own. And we we kind of were back and forth between: do we start a regular uh, a cooperative? Do we start a not for profit? Um, and we decided actually to kind of combine them. Um, because we felt it was really important to create a structure that we could horizontally lead, manage, make decisions. And so we so we organized a worker-directed nonprofit, which means that all of us who are part of, of the nonprofit make the decisions. And the board, um, as part of our organization, is, a, is another voice in the process in a kind of shared way rather than in a telling us what to do sort of way. Um, and so... Udi and I and our, we also have um, two kids who probably will be waking up any second, um, but we decided to create this, um, this nonprofit, we called it the Enliven Cooperative, which is connected to, to the work that Udi and I were doing that kind of led into the Ecoversities um, um, work, but bo bo both of us were very much on an academic career path. Um, I'm now working actually at another nonprofit here in Hawaii, um, lo locally in the food system, um, doing a lot of work on the ground, um, which is which is which has been a wonderful experience. But my but my work within the Enliven Cooperative is really where my heart and soul is. Um, it's been a very organic process, and we've been working together with folks from all over. Um, our we're very kind of broad ranging, you know, what do we do? What's our mission? But it's, but essentially it's just what's written there. We have come together with shared values and practices of reimagining learning, research, collaboration in, in the support of people, communities, um, place and organizations with tools, practices and sensibilities to, to co-construct intercultural and ecological worlds. Um, and so, the way we make decisions about what we do is we host meetings and we have, you know, very open conversations. Um, all the folks who are part of our our friendship, our group, um, and we also have brought in lots of other folks. Um, when and if the um, when 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 and if the circumstances allow, just to see how we can expand this in new and interesting ways. And today we'll be talking about a few. Um, key projects that are really core to what we do and who we are. Mm -hmm. um, so we offer a range of learning experiences at the moment, um, journeys, programs, courses, workshops that really we, we really had, I, I think we talked for about what, a year or so about what values we wanted to, to really center within the organization. And so um, and also as a kind of critique of the university system that we were both, well, all of us were at one point and maybe still are um, mm -hmm. working in. Um, I mean, Udi and I are still engaged in the university in, in various ways. But what the, the values and practices were prioritizing our relationality. So, so really the essence of working together, of building relationships, um, and not just between us as humans, but between the non-human friends and kin around us. Um, we prioritize emplacement. Um, and so, you know, what does it mean to actually work, build, de design in the places that we are in an, in an embodied way? Um, and, the, and this next concept Udi's gonna be talking more about, but um, this wonderful concept and practice of cosmopolitical. So bringing, the, the bringing together of multiple worldviews and trying to, see how not just not just different disciplines but different knowledge systems can share and inform each other simultaneously and and which is a constant navigation um 
in both challenging and really beautiful ways. And, and that's really the, the, the essence of the projects that we'll be talking about today. And then the other one um, is Buen Vivir, well-being and responsibility, both as kind of intertwined um, areas. Here there's a word called kuleana in Hawaiian, which means both responsibility and the privilege that comes with that responsibility. Um, and that's and that's that's another important value that um that we're that we've been putting into practice. And so the work that we do, we really focus on co-designing, um, co-facilitating, and co-curating. And in a in as participatory kind of ways with that relational component at its core. And so one one concept that Kelly mentioned there about the, the cosmopolitical, this has been a, a concept we landed on and we're kind of borrowing from this philosopher of science, Isabel Stengers, that has engaged a lot with uh, more engaged with, with kind of uh, different scientific worlds and, and uh, the different kind of ontologies that exist within, also within the world of science. But what, what we are talking about in, in this context is another Folks have also been using, especially in, in anthropology, to talk about how when you are exist in places of different ontologies, so different ways that the world, the, what the world is, uh, is considered and constructed, um, that you have an encounter of different understandings of what the, the world or the cosmos is. So if you're if you are working in, say, uh, indigenous contexts, where you have uh, often, you know, the the arrival through through multiple ways. Um, of uh, Western scientific or well, Western scientific ontologies, but that's encountering another way of relating to place and to uh, who exists in that place and how you relate to that place. So the cosmopolitical is the sense that the, the as, as it says there, um, it's opening up and slowing down the sense that we already know what the cosmos is, and there is one definitive answer that Western science can can get, or West, the, the ontology that we're more familiar with can give to us. But opening up this possibility that there are other ways of understanding what the cosmos is. Um, so there, in in and and then in, it's Stang is bringing this concept that this this dimension of encounter of these different ontologies is also a political. Uh, work. It's it's about contestation. It's about uh, historically. It's also about uh, domination and destruction. If we talk about colonialism and imposition of certain ways of uh, understanding the world is on on other uh, people. So there in the quote it says the cosmos must therefore be distinguished here from any particular cosmos or world as a particular tradition may conceive it. In the term cosmopolitical, cosmos refers to the unknown constituted by these multiple divergent worlds and to the articulations of which they could eventually be capable. So borrowing from this, we, we have this sense of uh, that what we're doing is also what we're calling cosmopolitical learning, which is how do we learn in these in-between spaces, in the spaces of conversation between these different ontologies, which is, in a way is very much what this, this conference is about and what the Ecoversities Alliance has also uh, been about. So the other, the other concept that, uh, is key in there what was relationality and that Rosemary is going to bring us to this session now to, to talk about how we understanding into being uh, in relation to this too. Sure, yeah. So we're thinking about a moment um, at the beginning of the talk to sort of center and bring us all into the topic that we're discussing. So I'm just going to go ahead and read this quote um, by Tit Nathan and please feel free to gaze at that beautiful wood rose. Interbeing means nothing can be by itself alone, but can only interbe with everything else. Suppose we look at a rose deeply with mindfulness and concentration. Before long, we will discover that a rose is made of, of only non-rose elements. What do we see in the rose? We see the cloud, the rain, the sunshine, the soil, the minerals, the gardener. If we were to remove those non-rose elements, there would be no rose left. A rose cannot be by herself alone. A rose has to interbe with the whole cosmos. We can live our daily life seeing everything in the light of inner being, and then we will not be caught in our small self. We will see our connection, our joy, and our suffering everywhere. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, so now we wanna introduce this, this section uh, of, of the Today of the workshop, where we're talking about these interbeing learning journeys, and I don't know if I don't think Gerardo has turned up. 
on his, uh, uh, he's going to be able to parachute for a few minutes, but I don't think he has, right? Andre, he's not here. Um, so, no, okay. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to share, but this is definitely Gerardo's um, domain. Um, and I've been supporting him uh, uh, from, from Hawaii. But what, one thing that we've been hosting through the Enlightenment Collaborative are these, what we're calling these interbeing learning journeys. So just like I mentioned. The, which, which have been going since 2021, I think. Yeah, they've been going for like two or three years now. And uh, there have been a series of them hosted about maybe three or four every year. And you can see some examples here of uh, ones that um, they've organized there. Um, to different regions, uh, in this case in Mexico, but also in, in Peru, they've happened. Um, and uh, for next year, they're also planning several others in uh, in Morocco and, and in India as well. And the idea of these journeys, just like I mentioned, the cosmopolitical learning, is engaging with local uh, friends on the ground, indigenous friends who co-host the journey as a way of engaging with these different uh, ontologies, these different cosmos, but, but especially in a way of connecting to the more more than human. Um, so in the case of the Yucatan, the uh, it's, it's obviously the different engagements by which people are really connecting, relating to land and to place, um, to, to medicine, to food, to spirituality, but also to uh, issues of time um, and the cosmos, you know, the, the in the region of Yucatan, the, the the comet um, that, that, you know, destroyed, uh, that landed there, you know, uh, millions of years ago uh, is, is, has shaped the, the geology of the place. So then how do people there locally connect with these uh, these kinds of issues too? So there's also uh, archaeoastronomy that people are connecting with there. So th these journeys, in a way, engage with these different ways by which people locally are connecting also to these different beings and dimensions of of. Uh, ecology, geology, uh, and so forth. Um, I wanted to share just a, a, a short video from their latest uh, journey that happened to um, uh, in, in the region of Mexico. That was the, one of the epicenters of the eclipse re recently, because that gives a brings a kind of flavor of these journeys to. They, they've had one on, with an eclipse, and they're going to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm just going to share a, a video here, if I can. Can you all see the screen? There we can, yes. So, yeah, you can see? No, no, no. Yes. The, 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 the. I can see. I can think. you still see yeah. it? Or no. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Can you hear it? No. 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 Okay, let me try. I think you, you can't. Um... Oops, sorry, just one sec. Okay. No, you can't, you can't make it bigger at this. Um... Sorry. Try one more time. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Can you hear the sound now? Yes, we can hear them. Okay. The earth, the air, the fire, the water return, 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 return. The earth, the air, the fire, the water return, 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 return. Agradecer al universo por habernos convocado a este viaje, que más que un viaje de turismo, ha sido un viaje de... es un peregrinaje. A new uh, experience of pilgrimage. Así capaz de un pachamama. 
Jampuy kuy Capaz que no está mamá de ahí Pachamama Cómo vamos con profundo respeto Caminando, mirando, observando eh, Sintiéndonos Swimming with the sea lions And the dolphins And the ocean The earth, the air, the fire, the water, return, 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 return. The earth, the air, the fire, the water, return, return, return. It's our responsibility, I think, to carry our openness, our love, our appreciation of the earth, and to carry it with us wherever we go. Quem te ensinou a nadar, quem te ensinou a nadar, foi, foi, foi marinheiro, foi o peixinho do mar, foi, foi, foi marinheiro, foi o peixinho do mar. Never seen so many dolphins in my life. They were absolutely everywhere. Uh, one of the days that we we were traveling by boat, and it felt like, okay, if this is how heaven looks like i'm okay and you can have bits and pieces of heaven on earth if you open your heart to to see them and to live them el mar se convirtió en un templo en el momento que nosotros agradecíamos Jampuy cuy, capaz ni usted mamá y mamá cocha. Jampuy cuy, guaguay que cuna. Chayara muy cu, huequeña guinti, son con quirisca. That the land has been calling me, the earth has been calling me to connect more deeply. And I almost want to cry thinking about the ways in which that's happened in this trip. Sentir el calor del fuego, cantarle al fuego. I mean, it, I knew about it theoretically, but I felt what it what it means to be connected with something other than myself in terms of nature, the planet, other people from other cultures, and the cosmos. The light from the sun filtering through the water somehow held me, held, holds us, like the sun and the moon. Oops, I'll stop it there. There's just a couple more minutes, but I want us to have enough time for Rosemary to share and then for us to share in the second part. So Rosemary, do you want to go to the your engagement now with intervening learning journeys from another context. Sure. Udi, sorry, sorry, Rosemary, before uh, Udi, someone is asking if this is one of the learning journey Peru. Is what where was this video from Peru? So yeah, this was in Baja California, uh, in Mexico. Yeah. And this was for the eclipse. And that, that was actually footage of the eclipse that they took there, which wasn't like borrow the footage they, they actually filmed that. So this is a film made by Bernardo who was part of the of the journey documenting some of the things. Well and also that I mean some of the a, a lot of the people in who we continue to network with in these learning journeys um we have met through the Ecoversities Alliance and made friendships and relationships through that. And so um that's been a really kind of beautiful something that's emerged out of the Ecoversities Alliance. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for sharing yeah 
Yay. So while we were planning for this, um, we were talking about ways that these interbeing journeys can also happen in a more formal environment. And is it possible? And what does it look like? So I was able to, um, there's a lot of synergy and I took many of the cosmopolitical learning val values to inform and infuse a university-led study abroad. Um, so this study abroad program, um, I've co-offered it a couple of times now, once was the summer before last and then three years before that. Um, the first offering was a three-week program um, and it was combined with graduate and undergraduate students. And we had the opportunity um, with very strong indigenous leadership from our faculty members, as well as being hosted um, by EW, uh, local EV communities to learn about the Teo Maori, the Maori worldview, sustainable food systems, and then weaving that together with permaculture and issues um, around sovereignty. Um, so based on, we'll go ahead and click through, I have some photos to share, but I did wanna focus on outcomes and to think about, yes, this is a different um, population. This is within formal education, but the same deep land-based connections, the identity work that the students did is they had to put together their pepeha or an introduction to what, what mountain, what river, what peoples they come from um, was really transformative. There's um, within the Maori culture, and there's this idea of pot, Pi, and as the um, was communicated to us and the students share, I'll actually just share a quote right here about that impact. The Pi system taught us that everyone has a duty, their own niche to fill. The niche doesn't always have to be the same one for each person, but the point is there are no holes or gaps. The Pi system shifted my perspective in a way that acknowledges, appreciates, and supports each unique skill or talent that each person may have their own strengths and capabilities in community setting the community functions more harmoniously. So we lived in um, a pretty deep, close, intentional community, staying with our generous host and learning in a very deep cross-cultural way. Um, and through these immersions, um, let's see, I think this might be the last slide. I did wanna share just one more quote um, before that you can go back to the photo if you want so our brains can rest. Um, so thinking about the essences that came through in that short video that was just shared with the Enliven Learning Journeys, that some of that same essence um, and focus around time and space and presencing and being in place. Um, we see a picture of food, the being participating in the farming and the harvesting and the cooking together. Um, another quote I had from students was talking about um, praying and coming together before traveling, acknowledging those who have passed before, every talk or gathering, praying with and for food and singing songs, and times of feeling down or sick left a fundamental impact on how I am in the world. So I'm just going to focus on the next slide, um, because one of the questions that we have when we think about we're working at the intersections of community-based learning, we're thinking about university and community and um, what are the outcomes that we are looking at? What transformations are we seeking? And many of us that have come here today to this conference, we may already be coming with some orientations and openness and interest in this type of learning, but then we can think about a university setting and, and how can we help to extend that transformation and the opportunity to others. So this was a pretty powerful, this was a grounded theory research study that we did with the first study abroad. And there are some similar themes in the second one, our travels to um, New Zealand. Um, one of the first ones that was a really powerful outcome that I've heard mentioned also in the other enlivened learning um, journeys is that at the center was this idea of spirit or healing. And so this was where all these three different areas of community, place immersions, and cosmopolitical learning kind of come together. And the concept came up in the interviews and the students work around presencing, or this simple idea of just slowing down and being in our bodies and sensing and feeling the awe and the wonder in our world um, and embodying that wonder. And that was brought into being through ritualistic um, to sun, to gratitudes, to prayers, to being in the silence, to asking permission before you know, entering a certain space or a forest or sacred spaces. Um, another big um, pattern um, was through place immersions, an outcome that emerged that students shared was this sense of kinship. 
And this uh, transformative learning process was through sensing. So in that deep presencing and being in the bodies and feeling the living world and by loving and drawing strength from um, the land and life's forces and being attuned to nature's rhythm. So that's another thing I've heard from the enlivened learning journeys is, you know, they're organized around celestial events and organized around deep ecosystem connection. And through those deep immersions into place and the community, we have the opportunity to feel in our hearts and our souls, this idea of kinship that we're all related and connected. Another profound area, I mentioned that example of, of Pi and living in intentional community, needing to work through and resolve conflict and speak with each other with um, compassion and open hearts. So this came through um, the process of simply loving and opening our hearts and understanding that we're not alone, that every person is needed and has an important place and a role, something to contribute, um, that process of feeling loved and seen, and then learning from the indigenous and ancestral wisdoms that our ancestors are with us. Um, as a part of being a community, that's not all warm and fuzzy. Sometimes it can be really challenging. So also learning how to speak one's truth and the Maori tradition of the Kereiros and the like, evening circle to have space for that. Then the last really powerful section that students um, acknowledge um, and recognized came from not only their experiences, but also the way that, that reading um, and poetry and information and knowledge can deepen our learning experiences. Um, so this was where we brought in that, you know, multiple perspectives and worldviews and visions through cosmopolitical learning. And this helps students to envision alternate realities and ways of being in the world that that treat deep cross-cultural learning and even looking to another country and how their po policies and their processes of reparations um, have been occurring. So this led to igniting the mind towards action. So through the process of learning to listen to their intuition, to integrating these experiences, to doing a deep look into their own identities and their own privileges, um, and then examining through decolonizing practices that really led to who am I in this world and how can I show up and act um, in my daily life? How will I bring this learning back home to serve my own communities? Next one. Um, definitely between the first program and the second program where I tried to deepen the practices, um, I raised a lot of funds for an incredibly underfunded state university. Um, we ended up being able to support um, half the group as Indigenous students, still half Indigenous leadership. Um, but we learned through this when you're layering on cross-cultural learning with your group and layering that on with being a different country where they have their own traditions, that it's incredibly important. And I think Ecoversities does this so beautifully and well that these these are healing spaces that we're creating that require, we need our elders, we need our healers, we need wise folks that are committed to being in spaces that sometimes can be uncomfortable and to bring um, attending modalities and loving care to helping people navigate those spaces. Um, definitely, there was a lot of co-creation within the learning spaces um, from the day-to-day -day rhythm and we rotated leadership and students brought offerings that they could bring, um, but it was really important. So we had undergraduates and graduate students, so very young students and older, but it was really important. We did our best to communicate this in advance that you need to bring a level of vulnerability, patience and compassion to that work. Um, this type of the deeper you go also with the cross-cultural learning work and our experience through university study abroad was that it did bring up um, some drama and it required a pretty deep level of um, privilege and identity work um, within our groups. And so um, we had as leaders, it was a very steep learning curve too of the ways that we could bring in certain strategies like affinity groups that can allow folks to feel heard and to bear witness and to work on some of that reconciliation and healing. So that takes time, it requires rest, nourishment and play. And so being able to work outside with the land and cook together and play games and sing and making sure that we are letting nature also do her work was a really critical point. 
Um, we also really deeply um, valued and appreciated the indigenous wisdoms and also the presence. Um, we had our um, elder in residence from Northern Arizona University or Danae Elder, Mickey Blackcoat that came and shared her own um, knowledges and presence along with the Maori worldview to um, also bring these different modalities for moving stagnant energy and helping with that process of healing and recovery. Um, one of the major outcomes that I think was shared among everyone was the responsibility that what a privilege and a gift to be able to go on a learning journey. Not everyone has access to that kind of opportunity and feeling this really um, strong responsibility and passion and desire to bring that experience to share home to our own communities and also kind of a, a spark for action for everyone to step into their own power and their spheres of influence. Um, so yeah, it's challenging and exciting and messy and beautiful work. Let's skip to the next one. Um, and I think we did a quick checkup on text that we're actually going to save the discussion for the very end to make sure that we have enough time. Um, but do keep them in your mind. Like what are some ideas that you're feeling led to share? Or what's kind of stirring in your heart around these topics? And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But now we're going to transition to interbeing learning and territory and bioregioning. All right. So um, thanks, Rosemary, for that. So yeah, please save those questions and comments and engagements with your own practices of uh, interbeing learning journeys and any practices that have been useful and transformative. Uh, we're going to go straight into now what this this look like, not when you're going to another place, but when you're doing the, the work of interbeing learning in your own territory or, or deepening the relationship to place. And we're not going to explore in too much depth the, the concept of, of the bioregion and bioregioning here, but um, I think because just for brevity, because um, we want to hear from you all as well. But what I want to share is a, uh, a co-designed um, kind of action research engagement with this at, at the level uh, of, of this region here in Hawaii. And this is uh, also done at a, a, a kind of a uh, angle into the this sense of the bioregion because it's done through a, a plant, through a tree, a very important tree, both ecologically and culturally here in Hawaii, which is the, the pandanus. Uh, and of, yeah, across all of Polynesia. I don't know how many of you have seen this beautiful tree, but the hala tree, um, is this tree you can see in the background? I'll be show some more uh, images of this. So this is a, a project that the Enlightenment Cooperative is involved in as one of the partners with with other uh, local Hawaiian uh, nonprofits as well, including um, Kua Kanaka, uh, our friend Ku, who's doing another session now in parallel uh, today. I also hear from Hawaii, uh, the Kohala Center that Kelly is connected with, and uh, and the University of Hawaii. And the idea is that we're taking not a, a region, but a plant as the key anchor and the key being that is connecting us in this place. And this is a, a very important plant all around Polynesia. It's a, 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 it grows along the coast. It's very climate resilient, um, but also very culturally important. It was uh, the the leaves, the, the lau, so it's lau hala, it's the, the leaves of the hala, uh, are what the, the Polynesian sailors uh, wove their their sails from and, and navigated all across Polynesia. So it's a crucial plant for moving for transitioning between places and that allow the expansion of, of Polynesians across the Pacific. And so in this project, we're bringing together different knowledge systems and practices around this plant. So there are cultural practitioners who are the weavers, uh, who, who are, um, you know, do, I'll show you some images, but do this amazing work with the leaves, those who know how to, uh, take care of it to process the plants. There's the the land stewards or the Aina stewards, people that take care of land, take care of the groves, uh, university researchers from dis different disciplines, but also we bring in together artists, designers, people engaged in communication uh, to explore this and create projects around this climate resilience, uh, cultural, economic, and social, and ecological re regenerative potential of, of Hala. So we co-creating co what this could look like in terms of different conservation and education projects, but also one thing that we're doing through this is this uh, 
cosmopolitical engagement across these different ways of connecting with and knowing about Hala, we're bringing this together in a exhibition next year here in Hawaii, where we are also going to open up this, the creativity, which I think that's, that's another really important ingredient that, that Rosemary mentioned. Creativity has also a, a really amazing uh, weaving glue that brings people together. Uh, and so we are co-creating pieces that are going to be in this exhibition and different ideas of the potentials for Hala through this. So uh, I'm just going to show you some images here. So this is uh, one of the ways that we're working in this project is that we are periodically meeting up with these different uh, uh, people for that are part of the, of the project. We're going to different sites around the island of people that are engaging in either taking care of Hala or in this case of regenerating Hala. So this is Pohoiki Beach, uh, a, a place that was uh, covered with the, the more recent lava flow in 2018. And this is our friend Anna. And in, through her organization, you can see the, the small keiki, the, the small plants of hala that are being reforested by on this beach side. It's a coastal uh, plant. So we're kind of getting to know the, how people are doing this, uh, learning about the practices of caring for hala. Yeah, next slide. Um, this one here is another place in the grove uh, up in Nuli'i in the Kohala region, another part of the island, where a, a much more established uh, grove that was severely reduced by the sugar cane era and plantations that happened in Hawaii. Um, but this is a, a site that they are taking care of. So again, there uh, with the Kohala Center, they're looking at the different ways to care for Hala and learning about how to do that through periodic observation, as I say in Hawaii, kilo. So it's the, the sense of observing the multiple stages and cycles that Hala goes through across time uh, and um, and the relationship to other beings in that place too. So there you can see some of the artists uh, visiting uh, the grove. Hala used to be everywhere on the island. And so it's, it's rare now to, to see the groves, how they are. All the kind of more ancient um, chants, hula, a lot of the stories have hala in them. Um, I'm a hula dancer and a lot of the dances we do, we literally embody hala as part of what we dance and what we chant. And so the, the kind of richness of hala in terms of ancient stories is really important. And so, you know, these these photos that Udi is showing, they're on there. They're, I mean, one was in the southern end of the island. This is in the northern end of the island. So we're visiting also as a collective did, did different places both where they're trying it's trying to be regenerated but it, but it's also thriving mm. and so the, in terms of the so you can see it's a very distinct the roots you can see of this tree right it's, uh, it's, uh, some people talk about it as the walking tree and it, it moves slowly towards water it reaches to water so all the different parts of the plant are used as well so we are learning and relearning um, the different ways that uh, this can also be done in, in the modern day, because it, it was a material that was a lot more prevalent across the island. The material culture of, of Hawaii was was very much around hala. And people's houses were covered in hala, in mats, utensils, uh, Pillow pillows, <laughs> everything. You can see there on the on the right, uh, bottom right, those rows of the lau hala. Those are the rolled up leaves that come from uh, uh, picking from the tree and the other uses if you can move to the next image so it also has this amazing fruit that in some parts of Polynesia when it's slightly different subspecies they they eat them as well uh, here in Hawaii they don't uh, they don't really consume the, the fruit so much it's considered a famine food but they do make these beautiful lays which are very uh, very special very sacred for uh, special transition occasions in, in people's lives. So this is a picture of us making this uh, on the right, on the left, sorry, making the hala lay. And then on the on the right, it's this is pounding the roots of the hala and making a, a hula uh, skirt from it. So it's, it's a fiber that can be used. As and well. it's also used with with ropes. Um, yeah. And I mean, it still is. So. And then the the last piece around this is the really interesting ways that people are bringing their knowledge practices um, and tools around it. So these are the weavers sharing their ways of processing and making. One of the weavers brought here on the left, you can see someone, uh, uh, he inherited a box from a, a weaver. Uh, of, and this box, these metal tools is a hundred years old. Um, and uh, so looking at the, the, the creativity that people use, different, making up different tools and so forth. But then next to it, somebody brought a much more recent example of a uh, 3D printed uh, hala stripper 
kata, uh, which I thought was, you know, a very beautiful kind of embodiment of this, this sense of the cosmopolitical and the and the changes through which uh, these different practices and tools go through as well. Um, so yeah, uh, on that note, I'll pass it to. <laughs> I think Gerardo is also here. Pass it to Rosemary. Do we want to pause to make sure Gerardo can jump in? Gerardo, it's okay. I, I I just wanted to say hello, but uh, don't, don't want to interrupt the the flow. Sorry that I couldn't time it uh, well, but it's been very busy uh, here. Uh, right, so well. I, I just thought about uh, being here for ten minutes. Great, great, great day, Gerardo. If you can stick around, we're, we're going to open it up in a second. So if, if okay. you can, then you can. Continue. Yeah, I, I have ten minutes. And we can, we can stay here. Go, Rosemary. Yeah, you're grateful you're here. <laughs> So then to tie in this um, concept around bioregioning and what this might look like also within a university context. Um, so we took a, a typical permaculture, I guess, officially designed course over two semesters and um, going, sorry, back to that last slide real quick, Udi. And um, just thinking about redesigning it in a way um, that it's more deeply connected to issues in this region but specifically thinking about within bioregioning, how can we deepen our pattern thinking skills through the sustained observation? And like Udi was discussing the weaving of the hala through that relational work, that's also deepening our pattern thinking skills. And then thinking about how these opportunities also for deepening our relational skills through the very process of placemaking. Um, so next slide. So um, this course is offered uh, Wednesdays, once a week, two and a half hours in the fall with the weekend workshops. And then the spring was just a series of workshops with deep hands-on practice. But I wanted to just highlight one part of a quote from a student in the course said, this course is the anecdote to feeling hopeless about the environment. So when we think about helping to create this transformation and shift in ecological consciousness and how can we bring this level of healing into more mainstream education, does involve a fair amount of stretching and breaking and interpreting rules differently than maybe the university system might, but there are creative ways to work within that system. Um, this was a course with undergraduate and graduate, and we opened it up to community members. And then that way we were able to use solidarity funding to share that with um, honorariums for our guest speakers and presenters. Okay, next slide. So within pattern thinking, um, that helps to teach students how to think and see in pattern and subsequently how to solve for pattern. Now, this, of course, is a skill that has been a long part of human evolution and in it's inside of us. But I think that as we've gotten more disconnected from the living world, our skills in that way um, have not been um, refined. So um, helping to improve those skills and remembering that pattern thinking isn't just a skill. It's also an actual way of being in the world when we can begin to see patterns and connections. Next one. So I'm not even gonna, just for time, I'm not gonna go over this in particular, but just the concept that when we're solving for pattern, this applies to both natural systems, you know, pattern of noticing what side of the slope the trees grow on or what blooms when, but also thinking about designing for solutions that are social challenges. Um, so thinking about good design practices that can solve not just one thing, but many things in particular. So this photo down um, in the lower right and top left, we worked over an entire semester um, interviewing a variety of stakeholders and city and nonprofit groups um, in the design and proposal for an urban farm. Uh, it's about 10 acres on City of Flagstaff land. It was the students presented to City of Flagstaff staff and it was actually approved to move forward with the project. So it'll be our first community-based urban farm in our community. Go ahead and scroll to the next. Um, when we're thinking about design processes and pattern thinking, they solve multiple problems at once. So we think about that crisis of disconnection. We think about social inequities. We think about um, ways that uh, we're not healthy and using our bodies enough. Things like community gardens are a design solution that also help to disrupt other patterns that we see in our consumer-based um, systems. 
So go ahead on to the next. So that's one of our community gardens at Museum of Northern Arizona and Flagstaff. And that's a Kinlani program. Um, another picture of them that connects their own cultural traditions to traditional food ways. Next slide. Um, remembering also that humans are hardwired for pattern recognition. Pattern languages have been used to solve problems for thousands of years. Um, so this is a photo of our group visiting with a beloved community member, um, Tyrone Thompson, um, who very sadly left this world this summer. And that is him sharing with us from his own ancestral knowledges and tra traditions as a Diné farmer and combining that with appropriate um, technologies like um, hoop houses, row tunnels, and drip irrigation. Um, when we think about this process of pattern thinking and design work, this is also the very act of placemaking. So placemaking is an act of reimagining a space into a place where people love to gather and connect. So having a shared vision, having a shared project, going through a deliberative process to reach out um, to a diverse variety of community members is a really important part of helping to put together this design. And so the picture on the left-hand side was us presenting to the City of Flagstaff staff. And then on the right-hand side, of course, is their final design work after consulting many, many people. And it's still in process and will still be co-created with the community. So spaces are transformed into places when they're actually tended for um, and cared for by community. Next slide. And just in terms of these are all practices, the pedagogies for bioregioning, these are all, you know, the joy of coming to an ecoversities gathering um, is that they uh, embody basically all of these different elements. But I did want to tease it out and organize it a little bit in terms of being an educator that does have to work within a mainstream system. And I still can do my best to create the space, so de-emphasize these outcomes and assessments and re-elevate and make sure that we are integrating these presencing practices that in that um, learning journey program proved to be so powerful. And through participating in ecoversity gatherings, that was really powerful for me and for many of those experiences, some of it for the first time for me. So integrating that breath work, singing, meditation, movement, thinking about the creative arts. So what Udi was talking about with the hollow plant and the weaving, the very practice of doing handwork, of doing the weaving, of sorting beans, of drawing and free write, helping to tap and connect our left and right brains. Um, field journaling, this is a this is an incredible opportunity to bring the logical and the creative together through sustained observation. It's an opportunity to identify, to bring in, um, you know, native indigenous, the naming of the places and um, the plants um, that we are visiting. Designing, so this is a very emergent process. This is a collective process of mapping and design work that is very powerful. And then last of all is a mutual participation. So that means coming in, growing food, harvesting, preparing it, sharing, participating in the healing and recovery of ecosystems. So thinking about how we can physically be using our bodies and working collectively to not just talk about the healing of the world, but also actively work on it and in its way that it impacts us as well. Okay, I think that actually leads us into opening up for the last 15 minutes to hopefully have a rich discussion. Thank you. I'll let you go ahead and decide how we want to focus the discussion. So yeah, and Gerardo, you, you uh, so if you want to add anything to this, and just see if people have any comments or questions uh, from before too, but I think we just wanted to take, we still have 15, a minutes because we can go a little bit over so we can just open up to any yeah, any comments any people want to share any uh, of their own practices of of interbeing that have been impactful uh herado i shared um earlier the journey too i don't know if you caught that bit but if herado is here to also answer any questions that people have about the journey so. and i'm going to say goodbye i have to go take our children to school but really nice to wake up and share this early morning with you folks uh, Lorena, did you have a? Yes, thank you. Hello. Good to be here with you all. Hi, Rosemary. 
<laughs> okay, Dardole. Hi, everyone. So good to be here with you all. I'm just going to switch my view to gallery so I can see you all. Um, yeah, I'm really glad I came into this um, presentation, this workshop. Um, and I'm just feeling really inspired by all that you all shared um, and wanted to share and maybe see if a question arises from this. Here in Colorado, there's a little community of us that have started coming together to listen to the land. And um, we're just fumbling our way through, but um, but we actually had a really beautiful experience of, um, to me, it felt like sacred pilgrimage. Um, we did um, in a in a brief a brief two day stay, kind of a whirlwind. We visited uh, the Sand Creek Massacre site um, in uh, more southern Colorado, and uh, an hour away from that, or maybe a little less, uh, the Amachi internment camp, uh, Japanese internment camp. Um, it was a lot for a couple of days to do both, uh, so that was good learning for us. Um, there were four of us, all of us actually um, Buddhist practitioners in the Plum Village tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh. So this concept of interbeing is very much centered in the um, relational field uh, that we hold and in why we're going and doing these doing this pilgrimage to listen to the land that none of us are native to. Yeah. Um, it was a really powerful experience. Um, I can share that as someone with indigenous South American roots, um, the Sand Creek site especially uh, was very um, tender in me. Yeah, it brought up a lot of grief. Um, and there was one of the other participants, a dear friend, is half Asian. And so the Amachi site, I think, was especially um, activating for her around her lineage. And then the two other beings were white, um, white-bodied folks from, from here, kind of. Um, so I just wanted to share that. And we're just kind of blindly kind of feeling into what kind of relationships um, we have between us with the land, with these communities that we touched into, these deep um, wells of grief. You know, to me, they were say they're very sacred sites. I think of as a Buddhist kind of like charnel grounds to go and and bear witness. That's what it felt like more so than anything. We were bearing witness to a history of massacre and uh, imprisonment uh, of injustices that we don't learn about in schools. Um, and so, yeah, we wanna deepen in relationship with these, um, with these two sacred sites and with the, with the element that's missing is we weren't accompanied by, partic by um, community members who are kind of space holders of these two sacred sites. Um, so thank you for listening. And I don't know if any of you have any reflections. Too bad Gerardo wasn't able to stay, but uh, we brought in art and meditation and music organically as offerings from us that sprang forth and to help us process collectively what we had experienced. I can even feel the charge in my body right now. There's still more to process through deep grief. Thank you. And if you have anything to offer, I appreciate it. Lorena, I just have to say thank you for sharing that. That's incredibly beautiful. And I think what you also mentioned, like navigating with your own friends and, and colleagues, and then the responsibility of trying to hold a space for others. And I, I feel like such an imposter sometimes, and yet so deeply um, grateful to be able to bear witness, as you said, and to, to hear and witness struggles, and then hopefully be part of that participation to make sure that it doesn't happen again and calling it out when it does. And feeling like I, I also, it doesn't come across in the presentation, but I make mistakes all the time and simply with my colleagues, even navigating that communication and calling each other in and calling each other out. And just, it's, 
Um, I think that if we're in the space that it is feeling uncomfortable, if we're feeling that grief, if we can hold love and compassion for others, um, then it, it feels like we're doing the important work. And I think that one thing I keep working towards is just perfection is not possible, right? We are so messy and such beautiful and perfect humans. So that's something that I'm trying to lean in more to the discomfort. Um, whereas my comfort is not giving a public presentation. It's being a fly on the wall and listening deeply to others. And then after lots of processing time speaking, but I also need to sort of like own what privileges and voice that I do have in my position as a faculty member and how can I affect um, more good. So yeah, thank you for just sharing that story and the work that you're doing. And I have so much to learn from you and from others as well. So thank you. I mean, just a, a quick comment as uh, as also giving time for anyone else who wants to share something. But uh, I was just going to, my reflection is more that, the, like you shared, the importance of having a, a practice that contains it. And in, in your case, maybe it was, you know, the the, the interbeing, teach that hand, Buddhist practice. But there's, or in other cases, it might be that you, you're learning, you're connecting with um Indigenous people that have a practice of relating to that place or connecting to that place, something, but but whatever that is, that there is a, a container that allows for and encourages that that other relationality that, that is happening to that place and to the other beings in that place too. Um, and I think that's been something that we found here in, in, in Hawaii, how when we have cultural practitioners who are introducing us to a space through you know chance and through the practice of connecting to that space, speaking that, that the names of that space and 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 beings in that space, for example, um, or just being a circle in that space and us speaking to the the beings that we're bringing and the ancestors and the places that nourish us, which is a, a practice here in Hawaii. Um, just creating that container does create a different sense of being and arriving in the place and and opening up to connecting to that place and how important that, that is. Um, this, any other comments or questions or reflections people want to share? We have like just under 10 minutes, I think, um, before we, we need to close. Oh, that was Cliff. <laughs> Brother Cliff is here. So good to, <laughs> I can't help but open my mic and just say hello. <laughs> hey Cliff, we just saw you on video. <laughs> we just shared that, that short video from Baja, California. So um, nice to see you here live too. Great to see you all. Um, I wasn't following if there were any com comments or questions on the chat. So I don't know if, Rosemary or Andre, was anything? Oh yeah, there was a question earlier. That, so that that was in Baja California, that one. But that they have um, they have also had one journey this year to Peru, which was also uh, very powerful. And with Elena, who's also doing a session, you saw Elena in a video. Elena Pardo, um, who's from uh, from Peru, Quechua, um, and. Um, so they they've had journeys going through more connected to rivers and the, the valley of the Incas there. Um, and so, yeah, I think this the sense of uh, lacking the journeys there that you saw this this blending of journeying with the sense of pilgrimage is, is a is a is a powerful learning tool um, as well. Yeah. Um, uh, Lorena's asking Cliff if you wanna if you wanna share anything about the 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 Baja California. I don't know, put you on the spot, but I think that that was just a comment there on the chat. <laughs> so good to see you all. Um, the only thing I really want to say is that I I actually carry that experience with me every day, um, and. It's, yeah, I can't even explain why or how, but it, it was so expertly guided by the team 
and uh, Elena, um, that you know, I'm I'm still in conversation with everyone who was part of that uh, journey, and I I really don't have too much to say because it's just it's mostly in my heart this feeling of uh, um, and body and being this feeling of gratitude for that opportunity that um, among other things I I really hope many more, many more people can have experiences like that because they are um they're, they're profound profound thank you for letting me share thank you cliff mahalo for that um i will put the link andre you asked about the link to the video i can put that on yes the... please can i share something also that about the the journeys <laughs> That um, the last these years was in Peru in Guaraz. Um, they went to Chavín de de Guantar, which is this place where like so the Incas uh, lasted for two centuries, but Chavín's culture were for eight centuries. So this is an incredible place where the Andean culture used to have pilgrims there, like. Uh, there, there found uh, pieces of uh, rocks and gifts from all over the, the Avia Yala, actually, from all over the America. And so, and it's interesting how to see the architecture grow and everything. And they have, this place is built with, in collaboration with medicine, with mountains and plants. So it's, it was amazing they did a journey for four days walking and then they had medicine on this space um so it, it's one of like the like very deep like resonating with cliff like these very deep places where you have yeah like you kind of remember other parts of our history in time and i just wanted to share great thank you andre any other reflections before we need to open the room for the next session? Uh, you know, I'd like to just say thank you um, for the sharing. Uh, a very rich, beautiful, deep experience. And what I'm doing as I'm sitting here is I'm thinking, how do we make sense of all of this? And I don't just mean what you're doing or what the organizations are doing, but what what we're all doing. You know, what is going on and and what is underway and what are the intentions? And I love the discussion of patterns because there's definitely a pattern forming. But and this is totally rhetorical. How do we make sense of that? And that's just what I'm sitting with at the moment. But again, thank you for the riches of the sharing. And I wish I could go on one of these journeys. It sounds mm -hmm. marvelous. I, I was just going to say that this is a reminder for me. I usually try to avoid the online, too many online meetings and workshops and things, but being with a group like from Ecoversities and being able to be with folks that are on this journey very strongly and are deeply, rather than having to be the one educating other folks to be able to be pushed to grow and push our own boundaries and learn collectively and help to see patterns and speak about patterns and someone mentioned too that yeah they're not all visible it can be really helpful so appreciate that thank you thank thank you i just posted the the link to the enlivened co-op on the on the website and um yeah just to keep updated the things that were happening you can see the different offerings and the journeys uh through the links there um any other Comments, reflections before before we have to go. Just for a closing comment, I I also think that it's very important um, this idea of pilgrimage when you're traveling, and and this idea of how do do we engage with the territory and the experience from a different place of the extractivism that tourism have bring us in the in the modern days, you know? And I have to run to open the door, but I'm still listening.
I just post you one one last link there of a project we've been involved with through the co-op, which is more explicitly about bioregioning, which is the, the series of bioregioning conversations uh, from different places around the world that are also experimenting with this connecting to territory and pattern thinking and thinking about the the uh, the bioregion as a, a, a space and an area to intervene on in a different way as well. So that, that might be of interest to, to you folks there. But so maybe just, yeah, um, thank you all for being here. Really appreciate um, being in the space, sharing the space. Um, do connect with us if you wanna uh, connect further on any of these topics.